Welcome everyone to the October 14th NEMSIS V3 implementation call. We appreciate you all being here with us this morning. We've got a really packed agenda, lots of great uh, topics to address, conversations to have. Please feel free to unmute or use the chat feature if you'd like to contribute or have a question. We're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, the first thing on our agenda is I'd like to introduce you to a new member to the NEMSIS team. And this is AJ Malik. He is going to be helping us with vendor compliance um, and other vendor issues. He'll be working closely with Laurel. So he's got a great mentor with Laurel. But we just want to introduce you to AJ. He's going to take a minute and tell you a little bit about himself. Some of you have already um, been able to communicate a little bit with AJ on vendor issues. So we wanted to make sure you got the formal introduction. AJ, you want to take a second and introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, Julianne. And uh, hi, everybody. Again, I'm AJ. Um, new to the team, going to be working with most of you uh, for the compliance part of things and hopefully, you know, being able to resolve some issues if as they arise. Um, hopefully there's no issues, but, you know, I would still like to meet you guys and communicate with everybody and help resolve issues that do arise. I will be working directly with Laurel as well. So, um, typically, the things that you would be seeing with Laurel, you would be seeing with myself as well. And, you know, I'm just really excited to be here and meet everyone. We're excited to have AJ. He'll be a great asset to our team. Next up on the list is Laurel. And we've put all of Laurel's topics together. So we get all Laurel for the next few minutes. Hi, everyone. <clears throat> Good morning. Uh, sorry about the barking dog in the background. Hopefully you can't hear it. <laughs> Hopefully he stops in a second. Uh, so the first thing I'm going to talk about is the October maintenance update. Um, so we are not doing any maintenance in October. Our original plan was to deploy 3.5 data acceptance, but we ran into a little hiccup in our late stage of testing, and we're having to delay that for uh, probably just a few weeks as we um, correct those issues now rather than run into them later uh, as we go live. Um, so our October maintenance is canceled um, and there just isn't anything going on this week in terms of maintenance. All systems should remain up and functional and if you notice that they're not, please let us know. Um, so that's the maintenance update. Uh, so then next is the suggested list compliance testing component. After um, our first round of compliance testing for 3.5, we've made some adjustments to the implementation and the compliance testing guides have been updated. So if you are soon to be doing compliance testing on 3.5, I would highly, highly recommend you visit the compliance page of the NEMSIS website and read the appropriate testing guide for your version and type of testing. Um, we have updated the collect data guide to include a statement about how we are testing defined lists. Um, there are now three components to this testing. You must deploy the most current defined list for each element which implements them. You must include a mechanism to facilitate the efficient identification of the most appropriate value, such as a hierarchical structured list or a smart lookup or, I don't know, mind reading, something like that. And then additional values are allowed to appear in the list as long as you have the suggested list at a minimum. So you can find more detail on that along with all the other testing requirements and testing process in the compliance testing guide for the type and version of testing that you are going through. So once again, that's on the compliance page of the NEMSIS website under technical resources. Highly encourage anyone doing any type of compliance testing to check that page out. Uh, let's see. The next topic is um, EMS software slated to forfeit compliance in 2021. Uh, let me just get rid of the dog who won't stop barking. I'll be right back. I'm really sorry. It only happens when I'm on the phone. It's like they know. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and just share a list for this. Uh, 
share screen. All right, so here's the list of software companies that are going to, going to lose their 3-4 compliance at the end of this year um, due to the either the recertification requirement, not the recertification requirement, either the call participation or the annual meeting participation requirement. If your company is on this list, someone from the TAC will reach out to you uh, before the end of the year to discuss uh, how you'll move forward and what, what your options are. But we would just like to share this list so that everyone is aware of um, who's on it. And I think that was my last topic. So if anyone has any questions about this that are perhaps not just specific to your company, um, we could probably answer those now. Laurel, hi, uh, this is Adam. Um, about the cloud PCR, they're the PA state vendor. Do you know anything if that matters? I, again, can't answer any specific questions about this, about specific oh, vendors okay. and how it's going to be handled. Okay, I thought Cloud that's Cloud PCR what... is on the list as for, they either didn't attend the meeting or they didn't attend enough of these calls. I can't say how we're gonna, how that's gonna shake out at the end of the year, but okay. as the you. policy is written, they are slated to fall off the list. All right, I'll ask a more uh, generic question for something else then. For the, uh, um, suggested list and hierarchy and most current uh, compliance testing. Will that apply to the testing at the end of this year or is that starting 2021? It applies to 3.5 only. Yeah, okay, thanks. So anyone testing on 3.5, even if you test right now, even if you put your application in three months ago. Sure, all right, great, thanks. So is, is there, there can, any, uh, can we go back to uh, your question about cloud and PCR, cloud PCR? Um, I, I didn't really get the question. Okay, um, Cloud PCR is the state vendor for mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. So, I mean, I can't, I didn't look in detail what, how the other folks are involved, but they're the only one that, that jumps out to me. So I was, just had a question about uh, how that affected any anything with uh, the, the state or yeah. Okay, and um, I apologize. We're working with those individually. Um, I would have to go back and see specifically what they attended, what they didn't attend. Um, and then it really depends. We've actually talked to Nasumso and uh, their executive board um, at their meeting last month to ask them what happens if um, we say that based on these rules that we put out there that um, a service or, no, I'm sorry, a vendor is no longer compliant and the state had a requirement that to work in that state, you needed to be compliant. So we, we've uh, taken the first step in talking with them. Our next step is to talk with the vendor itself and see what the problem was, what the concern was, why everybody else uh, seemed to be able to do this, but this small group of people here. So uh, I, I think the next step is after we get their feedback, then we'll decide what the action is going to be. But um, you're right. I think that is the only state vendor that I see on the list. And uh, Laurel is also correct in that we have not had a definitive direction from council as to the direction we can go with just pulling their compliance all together based on the rules that we've established. But that is the direction that we're heading in. Thank you. So is there any requirements on the NEMSIS TAC about being a compliant repository in order to send into the national repository? Yes, yes, that's um, in our documentation. If um, a vendor, a state vendor wants, wishes to submit to the, the tax repository, we do ask that you're compliant. Okay. I mean, that's, that's the, the overall problem with this process, quite frankly, is that we set it up so that we would get participation from individuals that we hadn't gotten participation with, but that truly states directors and state data managers were complaining about because there was a lot of information at the time when we were doing this about the 3.5 process and the, the move from 3.4 to 3.5 and so on. And there was this lack of communication and people were pointing the fingers at each other. Uh, the vendors were saying, we didn't know about this. 
the state data managers were saying our vendors weren't keeping up, and then, then the vendors were blaming the states for not wanting to move forward or for dragging their feet on getting back to them. So we established this process to track it. And quite honestly, it's worked pretty well. We have a great um, participation in our calls. We have a lot more input on our calls. And uh, it's just, it seems like we have a small group of people that for whatever reason um, haven't participated. And quite honestly, we're trying to figure out how to deal with them. And uh, our next step is to do that on an individual basis. But um, that's our next, uh, our next step in the process just to be open and upfront about it. Um, we heard everything from the SEMSO from if they're compliant, they're compliant. If they're not, they're not to, we need to think about what this would do to a state that has uh, something in their, their authorities that says that a vendor has to be compliant, whether that's at the state level or whether that's at the local level. So uh, stand by for more on this, but uh, you know, it certainly says something about the, uh, the organization if uh, they're not willing to participate like the others are. We have a couple of uh, comments in the chat. This is Clay. Um, um, Richie, did, did um, Eric's comment answer your question about how this affects um, services using that vendor? I think um, the um, process is still developing as to what will happen to these vendors. At, the beginning of the year, as Eric mentioned, did that answer the question and that we just, um, the exact effect just isn't known yet. Yeah, that's what it sounds like. Okay. Stay tuned, I guess. That yeah. is Ridgely, but it, I, I would ask Ridgely that when you talk with your vendor, you would ask them why they aren't participating. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, I'll leave that between you and the vendor. <laughs> oh, okay, well, that's fine. I, I, I would just say that if I was in a, in a, I have been in a, in a position with the state EMS office where I work directly with numerous uh, uh, vendors, both on uh, provider tracking systems and on EPCRs. And uh, if they weren't, I would want to know why they're not participating uh, to look out for my best interest, if nothing else. But uh, we'll certainly let you know and keep you in the loop. Thanks, Clay. Yeah, thanks, Eric. And that probably answers your question, um, um, Emma, as well. Is that correct? Are you okay? with that response. Okay, good. Yeah, thank you, Emma. Are there any other questions for Laurel? All right. Next up on our list, um, we're gonna do, have some conversation about uh, ET3. So I'll turn that over to you, Clay. Okay, great. Yeah, thank you everyone for joining us today. And we have a lot of great information regarding ET3 to present today. So thank you for, for joining in. Um, I'll turn it over quickly to uh, John, Met, John Bennett, who is associated with uh, the ET3 a kind of IT development team uh, to talk about this week, um, where it's the first opportunity for the EMS vendors to onboard and to, and to test. Um, we've made some modifications to that just because of how quickly this data has come on. And John will talk about that a little bit, and then we'll go through the schedule as you, as you saw there. I just um, wanted to mention quickly that um, the ET3 participation agreement was released um, uh, by CMS, uh, I think late last week, actually, I think Friday of last week. And, and um, a view of this document is here. It's, it's the participation agreement for each of the, of the agencies and the other partners who will be participating in ET3. But it's, it's an incredibly valuable document in that it, it, it contains a lot of definitions, ET3 definitions that we, we have had questions about. Um, it also has kind of general requirements uh, that the states may want to understand that are associated with uh, uh, participation. And then also it provides a really good overview of the interventions that will be evaluated in the model. So if you have interest, in, if you've not had a chance to see this and have interest in just just us uh, sending it to you. Just um, please add that 
um, request to the chat, and we'll make sure that you get a copy out. I think I think it may it may answer a number of questions that people have. Um, all right, John, I'm gonna I'm gonna turn the time over to you, John. I know you wanted to go over the um, uh, the week um, uh, for testing and for and for onboarding uh, this week and and uh, how that might potentially extend into next. So I'll, I'll stop sharing. I think you might wanna share, John, I think. Sure, thanks, uh, thanks Clay, and thanks everyone. Um, Neil, I have on the phone. Uh, I wanted to see if he could just uh, kick us off with this discussion real quick, and then I'll jump into the details. Yeah, thanks, John. Um, this is Neil with um, ET3. So thank you all for taking the time and, and giving us some time to present, Dr. Mann. Um, I guess briefly on a broad overview, we, we took some of the feedback about just maybe uh, the fact that the original testing plan was a little crunch. So what John will present is just a little more spaced out of a testing plan. I also want to emphasize that this is by no means the definitive test. We've got this one planned out that John will go over and then another one planned for December. And we're open as well to revisiting how this initial test goes this month and looking at any other possible um, subsequent testing, uh, especially from the vendor side. We're eager to get your feedback to see what you think might be necessary um, after this test. So uh, with that, John, go ahead and take it away. All right, thanks a lot, Neil. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Clay, are you able to see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay, all right, great. Okay, um, so real quick, we, uh, you know, we've been hard at work trying to get prepared for a uh, initial data submission test, uh, particularly with the vendors. Uh, we had some testing done in July, uh, just exercising our, our API, making sure that it can receive transactions uh, successfully. And uh, obviously we just received the ET3 Schematron. So having that now as a part of our, our uh, you know, our, our offering here, we're able to take a look and see how, how that piece of it is, is functioning as well. So this test is very important to us and we were um, very much eager to connect with vendors. Uh, I'm just gonna go in real quick and just give a, a sense of how we plan to uh, conduct this test. So we, we, uh, we have a schedule that we finally arrived at this week. And what we're targeting is to get together with uh, vendors, uh, particularly the ones that are e eager to get an early, early look at this. Um, tomorrow at two o'clock, we plan to have a meeting. Sorry for the short notice. Uh, but that is a, a time frame that we hope we get some vendors coming in and uh, we can give them an outline of how this is all going to work. Uh, one of the things that uh, we're going to need is a, a set of information from the vendors so that we can set things up for them ahead of time before uh, they're required to go ahead and submit uh, uh, PCR data. So some of that information uh, is we want some of the, you know, information about, you know, their name, uh, note location. Uh, one of the critical things we're looking for is the submitter's IP address. Uh, we're only going to let those in that we have IP addresses uh, for and so that's called whitelisting and, and, and that will be the, the basis, one of the basis for you being able to submit uh, data. We also would like to just get a sense of the software that you plan to use. Uh, a lot of the vendors obviously are software vendors and so uh, getting a sense of the version number of those and just making sure that they are national Schematron enabled. Uh, the, other, the other thing that we are requ requesting is that the vendors uh, create their own test data now, if there is a hardship on doing that, we are prepared to provide you with some test data. So that's another request that, again, we, we wanna just ask the question and you let us know uh, what your needs are. Um, obviously, once you receive uh, test data from us, um, you would be able to modify that to create some of the test scenarios that you want to see uh, exercised. So that, uh, you know, again, is your ability to take that data and do something with it. Um, we are going to provide you with uh, a little bit of guidance uh, and just to give you a sense, uh, there's really two steps to this process that we're taking. One is to request an API security key. And uh, so <clears throat> we are uh, going to provide you with some uh, guidance around that uh, during that uh, period at two o'clock tomorrow. 
and you would then uh, go in, uh, we're, we're gonna allow you to stay on the phone as you walk through that yourself to register. That's kind of a process that we're calling registration. And uh, during that process, you should, uh, you know, again, uh, very quickly receive your security key within a 15 minute, minute time frame. Um, we're gonna perform the onboarding process um, in terms of letting you see when this is in production, what is onboarding look like? So tomorrow, you're not gonna test the whole onboarding process, but we're gonna give you a sense of it uh, through our demonstration of it. So in addition to requesting the API key, you'll see exactly how you're gonna be performing onboarding uh, when ET3 goes live. Um, and then there is the data submission piece. That's the second component. So now that you have your security key, um, you can go ahead and submit uh, transactions. And when I say transactions, I just mean submit PCR transmissions uh, to CMS. And uh, with that, it's the uh, similar way uh, that you are submitting transactions today to the states, um, you know, so that you know, you just understand you're going to be pointing to a specific IP address uh, that is designated for this. And the same response that you would expect uh, you'll be receiving. Uh, the only change there, obviously, is that we have a ET3 schematron that we're going to be using uh, in addition to the national schematron and the XSD. So those are, uh, again, the similar uh, tests uh, that we, we're, we're doing today with addition to with one addition, which is the ET3 schematron. Let me just go real quickly to the schedule. <clears throat> this is um, giving you just some sense of some of the milestones at the top that we are looking at for uh, tests before we go live. So October 15th is when we do our initial uh, start with the vendors testing. I did wanna point out that there is a data submission guidance webinar that we're targeting for December sometime in mid-December, so I thought it would be good to point that out. And that will support you even further with, with details as to how to onboard uh, when the go live of January 1 comes around. Um, as you can see here in the timeline before, below the timeline, there is the schematron that we uh, had designed and built uh, and was delivered on September 1st to, uh, to our team. Uh, we took a look at it initially and then it was delivered to the vendors and right now we're in a period of test and implementation so that's the timeline that we're we're following as far as the schematron goes then with the testing as i mentioned to you what we're going to do is open this up between the 15th and the 21st so it's right around five working days that you will have to onboard uh when i say on board i just mean request the api API key, get that key, and submit PCR test data transactions to CMS. Um, and we expect that we're going to have results of the tests uh, being able to uh, deliver some, some sense of that by uh, October 30th. So that will be a milestone that we're, we've set for ourselves. One thing I just want to point out, which uh, the team wanted, wanted to mention, is that we do not want to actually use any actual data, PHI, PII data, or privacy information. So again, this needs to be test data that we're, we're getting as opposed to it being real data. So again, if there is a, a need for us to help you with the uh, test data side of it, uh, let us know when you, uh, when you get together with us. I'm gonna pause there, Clay. Um, I, I kind of think I've delivered uh, the bulk of the information that I wanted to, and just open up for any, any questions or comments. Yeah, great, John. Um, thank you very much. Um, we have a question from David Saylor. How can we get an invite to the October 15th meeting? Yeah, that's a great question. And actually, we're, we're, we're leaning pretty heavily with uh, the NEMSIS folks to help us with this uh, process. So I think getting uh, the communication to you, Clay, uh, might, if you don't mind that uh, I sign you up for that, and then you can deliver uh, some of that information uh, on the vendors that are interested to, to us uh, sometime later today. That's great, John. Yeah, happy to help with that. Okay. John, this is Eric. Um, the meeting that we talked about, or that you mentioned in mid-December, is there any way to get that moved up to like mid-November? Um, at a minimum or early, even earlier, um, if we go to even the second week in December for anything, 
and then have expectations of doing it on January 1st, I'm afraid that's just going to be too tight. It's going to be way too tight, especially with the holidays. Sure. Yeah, so the webinar is a product that we're having developed, and it, and it really is to support um, what's going to happen uh, post-January 1st. So keep in mind that everyone will have to onboard after we go live. And we're in a, in a period right now where we're, you know, testing and we're also, you know, uh, coming up with how we're going to make this work. Um, Neil and I have talked and we want to make sure that you have all the information that you, you can get leading up to January 1st. Uh, so we're open to using multiple avenues for delivering that information. A lot of it may come through the Nimbus TAC meetings such as this, um, and some of it may come uh, in other forms. But uh, yeah, as far as what is going to be in that webinar, um, as soon as we have confirmed things, uh, we plan to deliver that information uh, in another forum. And the webinar is going to be posted out on the website so that it is available, you know, after January 1st, uh, starting, you know, obviously starting when it gets posted in mid-December. But uh, yeah, just to, you know, echo what I just said, Eric, we, we're open to delivering information as it's needed. Um, or, or, or put it this way, as it's available. That's really what we wanna, wanna make sure we support. And then I'll add, Eric, um, if uh, to get more specific too, if you foresee a time, and, and we're obviously also open to specific um, dates from vendors, if there is a, a time window that you think works best for, for the group for some additional testing, I mean, we'll see how um, this testing goes if there's any other issues identified or, or things we may need to follow up on. But in terms of time frame in November, yeah, please let us know if there's a particular week, for example, that you could see would be a good in terms of everybody's kind of rhythm with what's what's going on, especially with compliance or some of these other testings you guys might have. We're open to that as well. Um, and just any scope um, suggestions you have for what we might do in November. Thanks, Neil. But I mean, I'll, that's up to the participants on this. I mean, I appreciate that, and I'll be happy to coordinate it with Clay on anything. But uh, uh, that's up to the participants on this call. The one thing that I, I've heard through normal, numerous emails and then response to this meeting and other meetings we had with the vendors is that you know earlier is better. So uh, you know, I defer to the participants on this call as to the timelines and, and things that they need. I just ask that this is your opportunity to. Uh, for the vendors and folks on the line. This is your opportunity to tell us if you need it, what you need and, and when you need it. So please take advantage of that because I have a feeling once this, this genie is out of the bottle that uh, the services are gonna be aggressive and wanting to do this and move forward. And uh, I don't want you to be trapped in the position of you can't do this fast enough if we had the opportunity and uh, missed it. For what it's worth, thank you. Sure, this is Frank with R1. I think we're still waiting on the scenarios which are considered billable under ET3. Um, you know, the web service URL, some understanding of how the authentication will work with the WSDL. There's a, there's a lot of technical documentation that seems to be still missing, or at least that we've not been exposed to. And uh, especially considering we want to start testing tomorrow. That's, that's at least our perspective on that. Yeah, thanks, Frank. Um, I don't know how much time we have left, um, Julianne, in the in the meeting, but I don't know if, if we can take a minute. Uh, John, if you wouldn't mind going over kind of um, some of the big authentication pieces on, as a broad overview of what we, ha we might have, because I don't think we've we've really been able to share that prior. Uh, if you have that ready, John. Sure. Um, I'll, I'll give you just a, a, a sense of um, what uh, what we have in mind. And, um, you know, just, just again, giving you uh, a feel, you know, we're, we're, we are looking at supporting uh, the API key request tomorrow. And what that involves is the, the, you know, the frame that's on the left-hand side here is a frame that uh, you would be filling out. Uh, when I say you, I mean the vendors. And uh, we would be capturing, uh, as you can see here, your source IP address, as well as, any email, email information and obviously justification. Um, as a result of that step, um, there is a, a step in the middle here before you receive uh, the message that you see here on the side, which is 
allowing for an approval to be done to this request. So we have folks that will be there on the, on the call. As soon as the enter key is hit on the left-hand side, they will then go ahead and approve uh, the request. And what you see on the right-hand side is the issuance of the API key. Now that key, again, is gonna be something that needs to come in uh, with your uh, transmissions. And uh, so we, we can certainly support in the meeting tomorrow how you would uh, use that key. And I'll make sure that uh, we've got that, that level of detail available tomorrow when we, when we get together. Um, there is gonna be a submission of test data uh, address that we would be looking at you pointing to every time you send, send a, trans, uh, a transmission. And again, what we're doing is not very unlike what you've done today with the states in submitting to the states. So again, we're gonna to point to that web services guide that's out there on the NEMSIS site, as well as the WSDL guide. Uh, we're, not doing, we're not doing anything very different here. So um, I just encourage you to, uh, you know, kind of lean on those, those sources for, um, you know, information on how, how to submit data. I'm going to pause there, and uh, again, I think tomorrow you'll you'll find more a little bit more as to how this is going to work. I encourage you to sign up for it because you're going to you know again feel a lot more comfortable afterwards. Hey, John, this is Jason with R1. Uh, I had a question about that. So, uh, with the NEMSIS submissions that we do and in, in to the states, they have in the request itself there's a username and password that we put in there. There's never an API key that we have to send with it. So that is different than standard Nemesis web services. Correct. Yeah, that's correct. So this key uh, that I mentioned to you, I think would be replacing that username and password. Um, you know, so that, that's really, uh, I think the difference here uh, between the transmissions. And uh, Josh, if you have any any thoughts to to deliver on this, uh, you know, from your side and how 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 the difference is between what they're doing today and and what they they would be doing with ET three. Uh, yeah, might... just just about to chime in. Uh, so based on feedback received from all of you as vendors, um, we we discussed uh, with CMS how the authentication piece would happen, and their IT. Uh, their programmers have programmed it so that you can put this API key into the password field of your Nemesis submissions. And then it doesn't matter what you put in for the organization or for the username. Okay, that's helpful to know. So they don't require, or uh, CMS does not require a username or organization. Right. And is that part of the web service itself? So that, that is a little bit different. Like I think uh, username and password and organization is required for states and Nemesis transmissions. Yeah, they'll be using the Nemesis WSDL. So uh, those elements will be there in your submissions. It's just that CMS will not uh, parse those two elements. They'll, they'll just ignore whatever's in there. Okay, so we still have to send it to be valid with the WSDL, but they're not being utilized. Yeah, and I, I don't have it up in front of me at the moment. I can't remember if there's a minimum length on username and organization or if they can just be blank. Uh, but yeah, they would have to be present, I think. I, I'd have to double check the WSDL. And f for multiple organizations that are in ET3, are we having separate accounts or not? I'm not quite sure about that. Right, like for multiple agencies that all share the same uh, centrally hosted vendor product? Uh, sure, so, or the same software system in general. So, or do we get different API keys for two different clients or not? And if, if it's one, don't you need the organization to discriminate? Yeah, so keep in mind, if you look at uh, what we're doing here, the sign up, uh, you have to give the organization name and, and source IP. So yeah, you probably are looking at uh, different API keys uh, for each organization you're gonna be supporting. Um, I, okay. will confirm, I will confirm that uh, for you. Go ahead, I'm sorry. Okay, so organization here is the EMS agency. 
on this screen you're showing? Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's what this is. Uh, and and we, we, you know, we've got a list of um, organizations that have signed up for ET3 uh, that when you put in this, um, this request here, you're going to be picking one of those organizations out of a list. And, uh, and that's how we're, that's how we're going to go about doing this to match up the API key to the organization. So uh, I will confirm that and make sure that that answer, they get an, get answered tomorrow on tomorrow's call. And then I'll just add in that, uh, so, sorry, um, for the organization, yeah, it's matched to the actual named ET3 participant is what we have for the organization. But yeah, we'll, we'll confirm and give you a better idea exactly what that'll look like tomorrow. Yeah. Thanks, that's, that's really helpful. If we could document this somewhere, these are key decisions in the design of our systems, whether or not to use one or multiple API keys system-wide and knowing that the API key is in fact the password and the WSDL are, are key things to know and I think should be documented in some kind of technical documentation for this interface. Yeah, agreed. So let us uh, let us figure out where the appropriate place is for that, and uh, I'd like to talk to Clay and Josh about where we should uh, deliver that. But uh, I agree with you there. Right. I'll add in that certainly on the ET3 side, we'll have that in our documentation that we'll provide to both participants and to the vendors who support them, and then we'll work with an MSIS TAC to make sure um, it's communicated through that channel as well. Yep. Hi, this is Kelly with Image Trend. I just wanted to confirm that I'm hearing correctly that we will also have the opportunity to join this testing in November. Is that correct? That is one we have not settled on a time in November. So that's part of my my ask is if there if there is enough um, interest in one November, if there's at least even a week time frame that you could give us that would be preferable. I keeping in mind um, the exodus for Thanksgiving holidays and stuff. Um, we're, we're absolutely open to a November testing. We just haven't settled on a time partly because we'd like to see what works for the vendors as well. So we also don't know what the rhythm you're facing as well from kind of software close of year, things like that. So if you could narrow down a time, we'd be happy to action on that. Would you want me to send that to um, NEMSIS or reach out to you directly? What was your preference? Uh, NEMSIS if possible. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And if others have have um, a preference in a week in November, also let us know either in the chat now or via email um, right after this call. Uh, um, um, as was mentioned, because of the holidays, there's just a couple of weeks that are really available. So we'll be able to hopefully nail this down pretty quickly. So if you have a preference, Kelly or others who have a preference for a week in November, let us know and um, we'll collect that information and get that back to ET3. Clay, I would suggest that we narrow the selection to the first week in November or the third week in November, first or third week, because the second week has a Veterans Day holiday right in the middle of it, it's federal holiday, and the fourth week is Thanksgiving. So I'm thinking first or third would be the, the best weeks to, uh, to run it. And honestly, either of those would be fine with me as well. Okay, great. So we're we talking um, October 28th through, um, oh, oh, no, I'm with you. I'm with you. Yes, yeah, sir. I'm looking. I'm no, looking the the November line. 2nd or November 16th. Yep, yep. Uh, um, do folks on the call have a preference for either the week of the 2nd or the week of the 16th? Uh, this is Dan with Field Med. The week of the 16th would work better for us or that third week. Okay, thank you. Other other comments? I there are no other concerns, Clay. I'm sorry, Kelly, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say we could make the 16th work if that works for everyone else. All right, Neil and John, why don't we tentatively settle on the week of the 16th of November? And um, uh, uh, to help Neil and John, who, who um, are feeling like they would um, participate that week? Uh, so it sounds like image trend. And who else? I apologize. Yeah. Beyond Lucid as well. Uh, field Med. Trauma Soft also. ESO as well. 
macrologic also. Was that mm -hmm. ESO earlier? Yes, ma'am, it was. Okay, thanks. Just trying to capture them all. Angel track two, please. Include R1 RCM also. All right, let me make sure I got, tell me if I'm missing anyone, image trend beyond lucid, uh, field, oh, what was the field one? Trauma field, med. field medic? Med, M-E-D. Field med, okay. Trauma soft, macrologic, ESO, angel track, R1, RCM. Am I missing anyone? Yeah, if you could add myself, Saddam from Seoul EMS charts, Golden Hour. <laughs> Yes, and Jeremy from uh, TraumaSoft indicated either date would work for him. So you could add him, um, uh, TraumaSoft, just to ensure that ET3 has an idea of representation. I think what we're hearing, though, Neil and John, is that you'll have you'll have some good representation for that meeting in November, if you go ahead and and set that up for the 16th. Yeah, we'll okay. work on our side to see to see about specific dates. I, I would like to emphasize too that if possible, the one we have tomorrow, um, we'd love to have as much representation as possible because we're definitely going over the authentication and access issues. So if nothing else, if time is limited, we'd love to get as much of that ironed out to really expedite what we can do um, in November as well. So at the very least, um, the time we have tomorrow, it'd be, it'd be great to at least cover the um, authentication API request pieces as John talked about. So that really sets us up well for any subsequent testing we'll do. Yep, and just to echo that, if you can get your request in today, um, we can make sure you get the email that will have the link, uh, the Zoom link uh, invite, and uh, you guys can participate, so is, thanks. Is tomorrow's meeting being put out to the participant agencies as well? Uh, is there, I guess what I'm asking, is there any other information that's going out that tomorrow's meeting is happening other than on today's call? I just want to make sure that uh, everyone on the team uh, that handles that, that isn't on this call has been notified of it. Yes, yeah, so Jen, I think your question, I think your question is whether or not uh, there'll be information that's uh, pertinent to agencies that are shared tomorrow. Is that kind of the question? Uh, participants? Right. I don't think so, John, right? This is just, this would just be onboarding for the software companies? Yeah, we're, we're really targeting vendors here. And uh, yeah, I think if we were to widen that, we'd probably have to have some other, you know, legal legal documents in place. So yeah, if we can target the vendors, I think that's, that's, those are the, that's the group that we're expecting tomorrow. This is Kelly with the Image Trend again. Um, I am working on, um, reviewing the participants list. And I was wondering if it'd be possible to get a copy of that list in an Excel spreadsheet. Yeah, thanks for that question. Um, yeah, we, we should have that available. And what I think would be a great way to do it is if, um, Dr. Mann, if you wouldn't mind pinging us just to remind us, we'll see if we can um, get one to you today. And then perhaps you can push out to the entire group on our behalf, since you have all the, um, all the information, the contact. Okay. Info. Okay, great, Neil. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Kelly. And let's just take just a moment. This has been incredibly valuable. I'm glad that we're really having this in-depth conversation. This will, um, will really, really help things. Um, um, could I get a quick vote of those who wish to participate <clears throat> on the call tomorrow <clears throat> at 2 p.m. Eastern time? I think the, um, the process of of sending out invitations here needs to be a little bit more formal than we have done in the past. So if, you, if you'd indicate just right now, we'll take a, um, a list of those who wish to participate on the call tomorrow at two Eastern time. Yes, so it does. Indicate uh, on chat or with a hand raise or? How about with uh, just a vocal you'd like, um, 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 mention your um, name and your software company and we'll get that list put together. Okay, do uh, David Saylor Beyond Lucid, and can I include others from our organization too? Uh, I, um, um, I think just one will be fine because then we can send you the okay. link and have whoever you'd like on the call. Okay, we'll do. Anthony's active the ESO safety pad. 
And Samantha Helgi with ESA. Frank Sloan with R1. Jeremy Clark Thomas with Sloan. Image Trend. Okay, I got Kelly from Image Trend who was also speaking. I apologize. Jeremy and Thomas off. Benny Shalev from Fireworks. Sorry. Say again from Fireworks. I'm sorry. And Benny Shalev from Fireworks. Steve right. from Macrologic. Someone, yeah, um, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Steve. Steve, Macrologic. Could you share your list, uh, Clay, just so everybody can see and make sure they weren't left off? Yeah. Um, yeah, can you share the list, um, Julianne? Yeah, let me type. I've just been handwriting it. So let me type it out real quick and then I'll share that and then we'll see if we're missing anybody. Okay. Okay. So we can come back to that piece. Yeah. If Julianne, if this, Julianne, this is Gary Ramsey from Star West Tech. Can you put me on that list? Putting you on right now, Gary. Thank you, ma'am. It's Frank with R1. If that invitation could include any URLs or IPs that would need to be whitelisted for transmission to this endpoint, that would be very helpful to ensure we can send data tomorrow. Uh, Frank, did you mean um, the RIP for you to whitelist? Yeah. Okay, got it. Ms. Julianne, um, please add Caitlin Henka from Angel Track to the list too. Okay, great. Any others for Julianne to add for now? We'll show that list in just a couple of moments. Any, any other software companies? Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Great, uh, great discussion. Hey, Josh, I'm going to turn it over to you to just to cover a couple of other things associated with this ET3 support. Okay, sounds good. Uh, let me uh, get my screen up here. Okay, so as was mentioned, uh, we released the final versions of the ET3 state data set and the ET3 uh, schematron on September 30th. Those are in uh, the Git repository. Uh, just showing you the uh, commit notes here to see what changed uh, between the draft versions at the beginning of September and this final version at the end. Um, uh, one significant uh, change to be aware of is in the type of destination custom element configuration, we changed the fallback codes for the uh, federally qualified health center and rural health clinic uh, custom values from the code that represents other in Nemesis destination uh, type to the code that represents medical office slash clinic um, because that's uh, these are health centers and clinics. Um, so we expect to uh, have, you know, less chance of, of collisions there with um, destination types that may have already been set up uh, for those locations. In the Schematron schema, uh, we updated one of the rules um, to only fire when the type of service requested is a 911 response to scene uh, so that we don't accidentally fire it on inner facilities and medical transports and stuff. Um, uh, we updated another, the, the rule about, uh, that, that says that the ET3 custom um, element about the uh, um, decision to use an alternative disposition that custom element, uh, the rule about th that element being present uh, is only gonna fire on incidents uh, occurring on or after January 1st, 2021. Just put that in so that when agencies go do their past year submission, you know, kind of that batch uh, of the past year of data, they're not gonna get a bunch of warnings uh, about that element being missing when that element did not exist at the time. Um, uh, other than that, a um, couple of little things, uh, um, you know, updating the Schematron rule uh, about destination type to match the fallback code changes that we made in the state data set, and then just correcting some assert messages and some pattern titles um, 
various things. So those are the final uh, versions for uh, deployment and implementation. Um, just as a quick heads up, we are working on the Nemesis 3.5 um, state data set and Schematron with the ET3 team. We're going through this, you can see this draft here where we're just going through and saying, okay, if they went to an alternative destination, what do these uh, disposition elements in Nemesis 3.5 look like? And where do we need custom values to support the ET3 alternative dispositions? And so for the treatment in place scenario, we have a few um, options that we're working through uh, that we'll be discussing with uh, the CMS team and then bringing uh, to one of these implementation calls uh, for your input as well. So just as a heads up that that's uh, something we're working on. Um, okay, so I think that was, uh, yeah, that was the two things I had. Any questions on those? All right, uh, Clay, I'll pass it back to you. Right, fantastic. And, and I will share my screen here just for the last topic related to ET3. We held a, a Q&A with EMS State um, uh, data managers yesterday to answer questions regarding ET3. I'm just gonna take you to where there are some resources there um, related to those uh, questions and those answers. So if you, on the NEMSIS website here, go down to NEMSIS 101. Um, down here towards the bottom is where we are currently putting the ET3 um, uh, products. Here's uh, just the training announcement. Um, what I did want to mention here is that we, um, we're keeping a running list of questions that come in from the state level in regards to how they will potentially participate in the ET3 uh, for agencies um, that were chosen for participation within their state. Uh, just trying to clarify um, what role they could play, would play, or don't need to worry about, right, in regards to um, uh, data submission from, from the agencies to the CMS enclave. And so we've, we've done our best to try to answer those questions. We'll continue to fill out these questions as um, uh, um, with answers, and also as more questions come up, we'll add those to the list. Uh, um, probably important for vendors to think about um, who offer a, a state level product that agencies use directly um, uh, to submit. Um, those I think will be the only instance where um, the submissions will pass through the state process um, uh, before heading to the, uh, uh, to the CMS enclave. And we've talked to the the state directors to look and see if their agency is participating and if they have they have a software product that meets uh, that definition then they'll need to be working directly with the vendors to ensure that the products that um, we've provided and josh has described are represented in in those products that those uh, participating agencies will see so that that will require some communication and work between the ems data manager and and the software product. Um, so I'll just mention that that's mentioned here in question three and also in question 10. So it might be valuable for the vendors to kind of go through here and see what we're offering as, as answers. And it'll also be a way for you to be able to direct any questions you're getting from the state level to this document um, uh, to help them with a further understanding of the, of the process. So any questions about about uh, this document or where it can be found. Okay, great. Um, uh, Josh, I'll turn it back over. You, well, um, um, before I do that, any more, any more questions related to uh, the ET3 project on, on any of the topics that we've covered so far today? Yeah, it's Frank with R1. I did want to check on the status. I know we've made a few requests for the uh, sort of billable scenarios and what is expected in each element. I didn't know if there was any progress on that document yet. Yeah, it's a great it's a great question. I um I I don't think that we have yet made some progress there. Josh, have you 
have you had a chance to think about that a little bit? I know we're we're still developing some some products. No, so let's uh, yeah, let's talk about that with the ET three team and see what we can help them come up with. Okay, okay, and some of the clarification of that may be offered, Frank, in the in the uh, participation guide. It has sixty six pages. I'm still going through it, but it does do a great job of describing the scenarios. And then you're right, we have to. It would be valuable for both uh, the participants and the vendors to kind of understand what what uh, CMS would expect to see based on the scenario. Uh, so that's a great idea. Yeah, yeah, it help us a lot to guide uh, the medics on the cleaning run records to to you know get this in the right bucket. So it's good. Yeah, so big help there. Thank you. You bet. You bet. Makes sense. Any other questions regarding the EC three project? Okay, all right. Um, I, uh, Josh, do you want to go over um, um, what we've done so far in regards to um, providing a more useful de uh, defined list uh, file structure? Yes, I'd be happy to. Um, thanks everyone for your time on the call today. Great discussion so far. And this topic might have some more discussion. Uh, we um, are really uh, interested in your input on this. So um, we've been talking for months about suggested lists slash defined lists uh, for these various data elements that are based on external standards like ICD-10, RxNorm, and SNOMED. And um, uh, changes have been made in the compliance testing process for NEMSYS 3.5. Um, and uh, uh, you know, decisions were made not to uh, define these lists in the XSD where it would be pretty rigid and and to add a value to the list would mean uh, rebuilding the XSD. A uh, decision was also made not to add these to the national schematron rules uh, where it's the same kind of thing. Uh, whenever we need to add uh, a value to a list, we'd have to uh, issue an update to the national schematron schema. Uh, instead, the compliance testing process will be used to check that software products have implemented uh, these lists as a base point uh, for their software out of the box. And then we've also talked about, well, how do we make sure that these, these lists are provided in formats that are, um, one, uh, useful for end users, useful for people in EMS agencies to know what's on the list, and number two, also useful for computer systems, useful for um, products developed by all of you vendors to be able to um, automate your processing of these lists uh, to keep your products up to date with uh, changes that come out. So that's what we're going to talk about uh, now is uh, um, creating a structure, a, a consistent standard structure for these lists. So I'm on the suggested list page of the NEMSYS website. As you know, we currently have the Excel files that we can download. Uh, when we grab one of those Excel files, uh, we see something uh, layout something like this. There can be a little bit, bit of variability um, because it's Excel. And so for a computer system to parse these can be, be a little tricky. You know, how do you know that cell A4 is a category and cell A11 is the next category and that cells, you know, B11 through B15 all belong in that category and that cell A16 is nothing. Um, so uh, that's that was uh, the request that we heard over the summer was can we put these into a standardized format. So uh, we've been working on a draft of a structure um, for these lists uh, uh, coming from an XML perspective, but also uh, keeping in mind that you may want to see these in a JSON structure, um, CSV, etc. Uh, but really kind of looking at the data modeling right now. Uh, and this is what we have for your feedback today. Um, I've got the structure uh, outlined here with kind of the definitions. And then I've got a sample in XML format down here at the bottom uh, that illustrates the structure. Uh, the idea here is that there would be a separate file for each defined list. And uh, the root element would be called defined list. It would have several attributes that would tell you which NEMSYS data elements this defined list uh, pertains to and which NEMSYS uh, XSD types it pertains to, and then the date on which this file was last modified. 
then it would have um, codes. And each code element would have several um, uh, attributes. Uh, it may have a category. However, we do have lists such as the medication list that does not use categories. So something to keep in mind. Um, it would have the source label. So, you know, for example, if this was coming from RxNorm, then um, what was this code labeled in RxNorm? A suggested label that has been issued by the Nemesis TAC for EMS use. The timestamp uh, being, or sorry, a date. I meant to change this. This would be the date on which this code was added to the list. And then optionally, any note about that code. If we look at the Excel files currently, we see occasional notes. And most of these notes refer to um, that, hey, this code is supposed to be used um, and it includes, you know, or rolls up, so to speak, other codes, you know, use this code uh, as the preference, um, the preferred code. So we could have notes there. And again, there's an example, a defined list with one code in it, um, just uh, one example. Okay, so I have a bunch of questions over here on the side. Um, so one is for medications and procedures. Should the NEMSYS TAC provide information about um, typically which licensure levels would use each of the medication and procedure codes? Uh, you know, the states uh, have to do that in their state data set and the agencies have to do it in their demographics. Um, and uh, also the structure here of a code having a category attribute, is that the best way to go? Or is it better to have a category as a parent element and then to have all the codes within that category as child elements? Um, if we were to go that alternative approach, uh, how would we assign a category for the medications list where there is no uh, category assignments? Um, and uh, we're gonna, we, I wanna talk about the dates and what those dates should represent. Should it represent just the date that, that this code was added to the list or should it represent the date on which anything about this code was, was last changed? So if it's category changed or the note changed um, or the suggested label changed, do we update the date? Um, for the notes, do we just keep it as a note like that or do we try to uh, implement some structure to indicate um, that concept of, you know, this code should be used in preference over these other codes, uh, other alternatives. Um, and then the last question I have on here is about formats in which these lists should be provided, XML, JSON, CSV, uh, web page, et cetera. So a whole list of questions there. I want to open it up for discussion and you can, um, address any of those questions or uh, any questions that I didn't think of, um, you're welcome to address as well. Just want to get uh, uh, input on whether we're going in the right direction here and, and your thoughts about any uh, adjustments we should make to uh, this direction we're looking at. All right, so for the, we're talking about the date, um, it sounds like you're wanting kind of a, is there a change log that would be associated with the find list? Uh, there is the, um, the, the uh, comment that goes in with the get commit. Um, that would be there. Is there additional yeah. information that you would suggest? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about the date. So mm -hmm. if, I'm not sure, it, it seems like it's, not enough information to know anything about what that means. So if we had a, if we wanted to say that this code was added, this code was removed, this code was changed with an additional note, that sounds like a change log, not really a, a date attribute. Yeah, so I think there you're was right. An extra, so a defined list having a, a change log here might be helpful. Yeah. Um, yeah. Would would you suggest a change log in instead of these date attributes in the file itself, or would you keep the date I've, attributes and add the change log? If the date could be you know, much more strictly defined, then perhaps. But 
I don't think it conveys very much as just date. Okay. Um, yeah, and this is clear. Maybe I'll just chime in just a little bit on the business use, just to ensure that we're we're thinking through that. I I appreciate your comments, David. Those are really helpful. I think I think the idea behind these defined lists is um, is the idea that we'd like these to be standardized across the country, and part of that process will in, will require that they be updated on a regular basis. Um, what that basis looks like, what that schedule is like, it is still to be determined. But if there are new procedures, new medications, um, we find that there have been additions to the ICD-10 code list that are valuable for EMS. Those, those type of changes, I think, would be made on a routine and scheduled basis. Now, how, how often that occurs, whether that's quarterly or biannually or, or annually, I think that that question still remains. But I think I think that date was there in part to represent that business need. I think it's kind of not enough for that because any, so you would have to have a, a timestamp, a date on every single element to have that, to have it do what you're describing. So every, you know, the label has to have a date. When was the label last changed? When was the note changed? It needs a date. Uh, when was the code added? That needs a date. So that's that's my concern with that. Thank you, David. Uh, if I could go for another one, that's okay. Go for it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so when you're the thing you write about the note, I think. Mm -hmm. So is that going to be something like the includes in ICD ten? Uh, those would be helpful to be able to say, uh, you know, this code stands for these things also. So um, yeah. it came up with a cause of injury where they have a note for, they have a code for homicide, but that code is intended to represent a range of things. Yeah, right. here's some examples. This is in the uh, impressions uh, sorry, symptoms list. Uh, you know, something like this note that it was added in in response to a request. I think that goes in the change log, um, and the rest of the notes that end up being in here are these ones that say, you know, hey, instead of using these other codes, just use this code. Uh, that's what tends to end up in there. Okay, I think I'm talking about a different kind of include then. So, if you look at the ICD-10 data page. Oh uh, yeah. One one code represents multiple conditions. Yeah, David. Right. Play, um, yeah, it is. It is. I think. I think the intent of this section has been a lot like what you see on the on the ICD-10 structure. Um, well, I mean, so the these are other ICD-10 codes that you know Nemesis is rolling into this. That's very valuable. Also, uh, I'm talking about. Like, uh, if you could you bring up the code for homicide, for example? So, uh, IC10 data homicide. Because, you know, we all need, you know, nope. fun, ah. fun topics in the morning. Did hey, I spell it wrong? There you go. Just change that to another. Here you go. There we go. Uh, it's, yeah, the last one. Okay. So, assault by an applicable to. There's also um, yeah, so the these kind of things where it's not part of the code, it's more metadata on a particular ICD-10 code. Mm -hmm. um, another one that comes to mind is uh, for some reason suicide attempt is not under self harm for whatever reason, but um, yeah, that that would be one of the excludes. Oh, the IC10 right. includes and excludes would be helpful. Okay. Oh, okay. Those um, already exist in the source in, in ICD10. Right. Uh, right. So do we need Nemesis to, um, you know, to essentially copy that information? Or can you get it from the source? Uh, so when we import the Nemesis code, 
uh, porting and the IC10 source is pretty complex. Uh, it is. It, yeah. <laughs> it's a, uh, that'd be, you know, a query, not just kind of a, you know, a lookup. It's a little yeah. more complicated than that. So. Okay. So it'd be a kind of a, a convenience thing that if it was in this file, you yeah, know, just and grab it. Yeah, we don't need, it seems like something that it was centralized would have a lot more benefits overall than, you know, all 30 vendors trying to implement an ICD-10 uh, query. Okay. Thanks. Hey, Josh, this is Samantha Helge with ESO. Mm -hmm. And I had a comment about the, including the provider levels for medication procedure lists. Okay. Um, I'm concerned that having it here and then in each state list and having conflicts there would be a little overwhelming. And so I'd recommend against not having that information supported in this document. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Was there any reconciliation done with the states, especially at California? Uh, this is clay no. Um, and that's a really good comment, Samantha. We, we thought that might be a feature that could be helpful, but you're right. It, if there are conflicts, it could be, mm -hmm. it could be difficult. And there, there clearly are, even within mm -hmm. states, mm -hmm. some, some differences. So Yeah, thank you. All right, um, let me just ask kind of overall general direction um, vendors. Uh, is this, um, you know, is this going to be helpful for you if we provide these lists in a standardized uh, format? Um, and if so, uh, what are your favorite formats? This is Samantha with ESO again. I, I think this is incredibly helpful and I'm quite excited to see this. Um, uh, JSON, XSD, CSV, all of those would work for us. Okay. Yeah, XML or JSON echoing the chat. Okay. And yeah, is there anything else in the chat? I keep hitting the chat button here while I'm sharing and I can't see it. <laughs> Yeah, no, Josh, we're getting some great comments about um, what sources they'd like to see. So yeah, please continue to, to post those if you have a preference and, and um, we keep track of all these notes. We'll get these back to Josh. Cool, okay. Yeah, and when I stop my screen share, I'll, I'll jot down some notes uh, about things that came in the chat. Okay. Great, um, wanted to um, also ask, uh, you know, in the, the way that I've got it outlined here, at least in an XML structure, is that uh, the define list element would have several attributes, and then there would be a code element that has several attributes. Uh, now, a lot of things in the Nemesis standard tend to be uh, rather um, group elements with child elements in them. Uh, so, for example, you could have a group element, you know, or a, a parent element called code. And then all these attributes within that element could actually be elements. They could be child elements, um, a category element, a source label element, et cetera. Um, does anyone have any strong preferences on, on one or the other there? Any kind of technical barriers you've run into with using elements versus attributes in XML? Hey, this is Jason with R1. So Yeah, Jason. Uh, so the Nepsis elements that's in the define list, the, that attribute, I guess that's space delimited. Yeah. So you could have X amount of Nepsis elements that the SNOMAG code applies to. I don't know if it would be difficult to parse it. It just might be a little cumbersome. Um, so I don't know if there was a better way to, to do that instead of an attribute. Yeah, it can be a space separated attribute like this, or if it's a child element, then it's just a re repeating element with, with each instance of the element having a value. Yeah, I think for the most part with attributes, it's been a one-to-one -one relationship, not many. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
So if you're working in .NET languages, it, uh, when you try to serialize and deserialize uh, XML, you to use an attribute, you have to do something special on the data class. Whereas if it's all um, all straight data points, you know, just uh, tags, you don't. Um, it makes it that much easier and also that much uh, more cross compatible with a JSON format. Okay. Thanks. And uh, another comment, if nobody else, but uh, mm -hmm. yeah, the Nemesis types. It's, it seems like a confusing name since these are not Nemesis, right? Or, but uh, I think each code probably needs to say which kind of one it is, right? Well, yeah, that's a good question. So uh, Nemesis types, these are Nemesis XSD types. So in the Nemesis XSD, there is a defined type called SNOMED and that is a Nemesis okay. defined type. Uh, but yeah, we do have the medication list where we have a mix of RX norm and a handful of SNOMED codes. <laughs> so, right. uh, yeah, so we have both types and we may have to actually bring the type down to the code level so you know which, which type that code, well, yeah. Okay, I'll, or which, which uh, data source, you know, did it come from RX norm or did it come from SNOMED? So that's something for us to work on. Right, and so I think maybe you don't need both the type and the element because the element has the type, mm -hmm. right? I, I think that the might, XSD. if you were trying to transform this into a human readable thing, I think that might be, might get confusing. Okay. Wait. Okay, uh, any other final uh input on this one. We're going to just keep working on it and we'll, I'm sure we'll be back to this call with uh, more refinements, but anything else at this time? Okay. Well, thanks everyone. And uh, we'll keep working on this. Um, all right, Julianne, I think I'll pass it back to you. All right. Sounds good. We still have quite a bit of agenda left to get through, but I think we're going to need to parse that down a little bit. It's 1021. Um, yeah, Julian, maybe we can try to get um, Monet and Kevin just to briefly go through those quick changes to both of those, yep. those dashboards. And then if you could show that list just to make sure we have everybody for the, for the call tomorrow with ET3. Yeah. That, that might round it out. That sounds good. Let me pull that list up really quick. And then Monet, um, you're up next. So let me share, stop share, and we'll give you some minutes to look at real quick. All right, so these are the ones that I captured and I can go through also on the video recording. But if anybody knows right offhand, if I've left somebody off, I'm happy to take that and add this to this list. All right, I'll go back through the video as well to make sure we've got everybody so that um, all of those who are interested will be able to have that information. All right, Monet, you wanna take the screen for a little bit? Sure. Thanks. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. All right, fantastic. Um, hello everyone. I just want to um, briefly talk a little bit about um, the data submission summary dashboard. But first I want to talk a little bit about um, one of the reports that um, was published on the NIMSIS website. Um, when, I when I read this um, document, I felt really um, blessed to be part of the NIMSIS team and also part of the national effort to collect data. I don't know how many of you had an opportunity to look at this document, but really what it described to me is this collaborative effort across the nation from boots on the ground to people who are writing software programs to collect the data and state managers who are submitting the data. Um, so just a shout out for that type of report. Um, 
Now, Dr. Rand had a vision for the data submission summary dashboard, and I'm gonna really probably blame him if I'm calling you guys too much. Um, this is where we were in the past. Um, we had a really high percentage of failed submissions. Um, this is kind of an exaggeration because really um, not many states have zero activations on the agencies, but the PCR warnings are still high as well. And so um, as of last week, we have improved somewhat because we were at 2% failed submissions. And this week um, we're currently at um, 0.37% uh, active, or sorry, failed submission. So what this basically means is that over the last two years, we've been talking about how to populate DEM, agency demographic files. 90% um, of the states have successfully um, implemented uh, the process for uh, pro uh, populating the DEM files. And so now we can move on to other topics. Um, the next topic would be active agencies. How do we um, produce, how do we clean up the numbers so that this report is more valuable for you? And then also some states have already um, worked on their agency numbers. They've, they've um, increased the number of agencies that are submitting. And so the next discussion, it would be PCR warnings. How do we um, start to address this particular issue? So this is the current goal. Um, I've shown you where we were, where we are now, and where we're headed. Um, it'd be really great for you to look at your reports and say, oh, wow, I have failed submissions. I'm in a really good place in terms of my active agencies, and how do I now work on my PCR warnings? Now, this represents the best in the nation at the moment. Um, this does belong to one state. I don't know if they're on the call right now, but um, congratulations uh, for successfully working on uh, several things this year and last year. Um, one of the things that's happening with the report right now is we have to address this issue where um, the active agencies, or sorry, the agencies accepted and the number of licensed agencies, um, the numbers are not really reflective of what's happening in the state. Basically what's happened here, <clears throat> excuse me, is this is a situation where the state only has something like 270 plus agencies that should be submitting data to NEMSIS. However, we did at some point receive 1,232 agency demographic files. So I will be working with states individually to adjust these numbers. Um, look forward to hearing from me um, as we try to address, um, are these agencies actively submitting? What, what number of agencies do you truly expect to submit data to the NEMSIS TAC? We realize that there are a lot of pilot agencies and agencies that maybe only have two activations um, per year or um, you know, a really small number of activations. So we want to make this report really meaningful to you. Um, are there any questions at this time? Okay, if you have questions, please send them to me um, either by the um, information on the NEMSIS website or you can send me a chat. Um, but again, I appreciate all the effort that states have made to um, clean up uh, their issues. This is not punitive. This is simply um, an opportunity to continue to improve the quality of the data. And I believe that everything that we're doing now with version 3.4 will benefit us as we're moving to 3.5.0. Okay, thank you, Julianne, I'm dead. Thank you, Monet. Hey, Kevin, do you wanna take just a minute and talk about the uh, resource reporting tool? Sure, no problem at all. Thank you very much. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. So, as many of you know, we have developed a, um, a reporting tool for EMS agencies to uh, let, you know, let the federal government know whether or not they are experiencing any resource shortages or stress uh, in relationship to the current um, pandemic. Uh, some of you may also know that we've created a dashboard that 
consolidates this information and makes it available uh, in, in a nice visual format. Um, I want to talk about some, uh, some additions uh, to this uh, dashboard that we think are going to make uh, things a little bit more useful. Uh, because there's been a desire um, from, uh, from a variety of audiences for the ability to um, take not only this visual layout that we've provided, uh, but also the raw underlying data um, that, back, that uh, supports this dashboard. And when I talk about the raw underlying data, what I'm really talking about are all the questions and answers that are embedded in this form. So what we've done, and I should note that what we're looking at here is a test version of this dashboard. Um, this functionality is live today, but this data that you're seeing here is not true data. Uh, we always want to respect the privacy of, of our participants. So all these records here are test records that employees of the Nemesis TAC have entered. Um, so don't, uh, don't be worried. Uh, if you're, if, if you know, this is some thinking that someone put in, you know, all symbols for a contact name uh, for your state. That's not what really happened. So what we've done is we've added two new uh, tabs or views to this dashboard. Uh, one's called COVID exposure and the other is PPE supply. And they're really boring. They're intentionally really boring because their goal is not to really have you look through uh, these, these data tables, um, but to download them. As I said, these are the complete question and answer set uh, that's available in the form. So for example, if, if you have someone, if you're a state uh, manager and you have someone in your, um, your state emergency uh, operations, a center that would like access to this information. And while we're in the process of developing uh, a way for those officials to have access directly to this information, the very least you'd be able to download all of this data and hand it off to them. And the way you do that is by going from this really, really nice visual, just clicking over to, in this case, COVID exposure or PPE supply, and there's gonna be a, um, a download icon. And here on my screen, this download icon is actually at the top. Um, when you go on to the Nemesis website, I will tell you that that download icon is actually going to be uh, at the bottom of the screen. So just be aware that there's a little bit of change in location, but the functionality is exactly the same. So if I wanted to download all the data here, what I would do is I would click that little download uh, uh, option. And while we offer a variety of formats, image and PDF are really for, and PowerPoint are really for presentation only. If you're really looking to um, download for distribution and further analysis, then Crosstab is going to be your best option. And Crosstab is really just a fancy way of saying text file that is readable by Excel. So I click that Crosstab here on the COVID exposure. It downloaded for me. If I open the file, boom, it opens in Excel for me, at least on Windows. And, and then from there, I can see that I've got access to all the information that is displayed in that, again, that, that truly boring uh, data table. And we could do the same for PPE supply as well. So we really feel that this, this serves an important need um, that we've heard from a lot of our audiences that they want to be able to take this data and distribute it uh, more broadly within, uh, within their state and perhaps um, you know, segment it in different ways. And as, as I said, in, in the near future, uh, we're going to be deploying another enhancement to this dashboard that will allow individuals, um, authorized individuals um, that use a state data manager designate um, if you want your emergency operations uh, officers to have this information, um, we can take those names um, that you supply us, give them a username and password uh, that they will be able to access this dashboard and be clear, only this dashboard. And that was a critical piece um, that we, uh, we wanted to make sure of. And then they'll be able to go in and they'll be able to see the same information that you as a state data manager would see. So they'd see all the data for your state, They'd see these wonderful visuals. Um, and again, they're wonderful because 
I made them. Um, and then they'd be, see the really boring stuff uh, that they'd be able to download and use themselves as well. So really quick tour on that. Um, you know, if you have any questions or concerns or, you know, want something added to this, please let me know. You can put information into the chat or contact any of us directly and we'll be sure to, um, to respond to your requests as quickly as we can. Thank you, Julianne. Thanks, Kevin. I know that was quick and thanks, Monet, too. Uh, we're going to go ahead and end this call. Thank you for being with us today. We will catch all of the topics that we missed on this week's call on our next call, which will be October 28th. Thanks, everyone, for being with us today. Have a good day.